Rub up your engines! Today we're going to figure out why this Honda Accord has running problems, especially when it's warmed up and restarted, stumbles around, even though the check engine light isn't coming on. Now as you can see here, when we start it up, check engine light's not on. But when we turn it off and then turn the key on, the light is on. So that means the bulb doesn't burn out like somebody just took the bulb up. But when we start it, it's not on. But that doesn't mean there still isn't information stored in the car. Check engine lights only come out beyond a certain parameter, 20, 25% or more. That way it can ruin a catalytic converter. So by law, it's gotta put the check engine light on. In this case, it's not on, but it's not running right. So we're gonna scan it anyway. We'll turn it on and we'll plug in the data connector. In this case, it goes right under here. And that sends the information wirelessly to the main control. And now it's thinking, PO 139, Oxygen sensor circuit slow response and it explains it's a generic code meaning that the sensor is Responding too slow and that generally means one of two things either the sensor itself is bad or the catalytic converter is going bad Since catalytic converters are very expensive. It's a good idea to try the sensor first Now there's all kinds of complex tests that could be done and you're paying a mechanic a hundred dollars an hour When you see you have a code like that with a vehicle that's as old as this, it's 13 years old, and it has almost 113,000 miles on it, realize that trying the sensor is a very smart choice to do first. Computer sees that data, if it says it's too lean, then it will add fuel. If it says it's too rich, it'll subtract fuel. Try to get it to run perfectly. So if this back oxygen sensor, which the code is for, is bad, and it isn't responding correctly or fast enough, the computer can be guessing wrong. They have various graphs that the computers use to decide how much fuel for how much air. It can make the air fuel mixture wrong and it'll do exactly what this thing's doing. It'll stumble. We do want to pray a little though <laughs> because it's a rarity for Honda. But if the computer goes bad, the circuit that drives the oxygen sensor could also trip a code like that. You got to wonder a tiny bit because it had that code, but the check engine light was not. By all rights, the check engine light should have come on too, but I've seen all kinds of things happen on this old. And here's a really good mechanics tip. Stick to original equipment. This came with a nip and denso oxygen sensor. Replace it with a nip and denso oxygen sensor. I know a lot of guys will say, oh, the Bosch ones are on sale and they cost a lot less money. Eh, don't do that, unless it was a car that originally came with a box sensor. You want to stick with the original equipment sensor. These things are very sensitive. They're made for the software of the car. You start flipping manufacturers, who knows if it's even going to work. So we're going to put on the emergency brake so the vehicle doesn't roll. A jacket up in the air. And why are we jacket up in the air? Because it's oxygen sensor two. That's the second one, the one after the catalytic converter. So it's in the back under there. And of course we're going to put a jack stand so it doesn't fall on our head. Better safe than sorry. There's the back catalytic converter. The back oxygen sensor. It's the last one. The other ones are up front. This one's right here. Need an oxygen sensor socket. They sell them at all the parts stores. I find these giant extension bars work best because you do have to break them loose. They are on there very tight. So we get the socket and it fits right over it. Nice and tight. And then we put the extension on and pull. You pull like mad. You gotta really pull sometimes. Once you break it loose, you can just twist it off by hand. Just screw it in. And then out it comes. Follow it through and unplug it. Boom, oh, we line it up. It's the front door. It's inside here. Now the morons that designed this car, you gotta pull the seat out. Because you can't work. There's no workroom or anything. So we gotta take the four bolts off and pull the seat out. Brilliant engineering there, Honda. You put the seat back as far as it goes. Then you take the two bolts off. There's one in the front here and one on the other side. You take the front ones out first. Then once the bolts are removed, you pull the seat forward. Get the whole way forward and go in the back. Then you remove the two bolts on the back. One on this side and one on the other. Then when that's done, you get the two bolts off. You can move the whole seat out of the way. And once you lift it out of the way, you can access the stupid thing. Here's the connector. It's hidden under here. You can only get it by taking the seat up. Really stupid. Then you get the plug under your oxygen sensor. And it's got to come out of here. This hole right here, it goes in that hole. So we fish it from the bottom so we can plug it into here. You want to do it from the bottom so you don't end up not having any room to push the sensor through the hole. Push this up from the bottom first. Then the old sensor pops off, and guess what? You plug the new one in. 
make sure it's the right way. The snap goes on the top. Come on now. Kind of hard to film and shoot at the same time. <clears throat> you heard it click? Now it's tight. Then of course you gotta put the seat on, but hey, while we're under here, there's a DVD, all kinds of stuff. Fingernail clippers, a penny. We'll take all this crap out of here as long as we're under here. Get that out of the way. <laughs> now we'll put the seat back down. Now I find it's easier to do the back seat first. Because you can line it up better. You can see there, it doesn't line up yet, so... We gotta wiggle it around a little till it fits over the holes. Then we bolt it in. Do one side a little bit loose. And then find the other side to line up. Then you slide the seat forwards and line up the two front ones, left and right. Then tighten them up. And right, now the seat moves back and forth. It's back where it was. Then I crawl back under the car where the other end of the oxygen sensor is and screw it back in the exhaust. Now you gotta turn it a lot to get it in here. So what you want to do is turn it the opposite direction first to get all kinds of play and the kinks in the wiring. So you'll have enough twistability. Then you stick it in, and as you turn it, it on kinks what you've kinked. So it won't be kinked when you're done. See, it's perfectly fine now. Then with your socket and bar on, uh, get it nice and tight. Uh, you don't want the exhaust leaking. Then get rid of your jack stand. If you let the jack down with the jack stand, it'll be sitting on that, so. Don't forget to remove it. Let the jack down and take it for a ride. We'll start her up and see what happens. Now we're taking for a little ride here, and let's see how it accelerates. Hey, for an old car, still got plenty of zip to it. Now when I hook up the scan tool, it doesn't show any code yet. Just realize, those codes can sometimes take days or weeks to come back. So, you'll know after two or three weeks, it doesn't come back, that definitely fixed the problem. We want to pray that the catalytic converter doesn't have a problem too, or the main computer. Only time's gonna tell with this, but it's running perfectly fine. It wasn't before, so we've obviously fixed one thing, and we'll know in time if anything else is also gonna go. Because realize codes, if it sticks one code, it generally stops there and doesn't analyze any further. So sometimes you fix one code, and then later a different code pops up because it didn't know there was another problem because it stopped at the first problem. But once that layer was fixed, another one shows up. But this one is running better, so we know we fixed something. Let's just pray that it doesn't turn out to be a deeper problem. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Jerome's the bomb says, I got a 2010 Chevy Malibu four cylinder. I was driving down the road and it just died. So I had it towed to my house. Now when I jump it with a battery, it runs fine, but as soon as I disconnect it, it dies. Johnny, that's a relatively simple process. Usually means your alternator has died. Your car runs on electricity, and the alternator charges the battery. If the alternator stops working, eventually you run out of power. The battery will drain itself, just like you turn the flashlight on, eventually it goes to zero, because it runs out of power. You jump start a completely dead car, and it starts up, but then when you take the cables off, it dies. That generally means that your alternator is no longer charging the battery, and it's running off of the jumper battery, and as soon as you disconnect it, there's no power, and it dies. Have your alternator tested. Odds are that's all that it is. I mean, you could have a wiring problem or things like that, or even a computer failure, but since it starts, and then as soon as you take it off, it dies, odds are your alternator's bad. Now, of course, check the wires to make sure none of the alternator wires are brittle or corroded or fell off, but most of the time, it's as simple as an alternator, and I mean, if you want, you can easily just take the alternator off, take it to a place like AutoZone, they test them free, and they'll tell you if it's good or not. 99% of the time, that's just a bad alternator. Joe R. says, Scotty, our 2012 Mini Cooper Clubman vehicle's good vehicle. My mom owned it and put 3,000 miles on, kept it in good shape. I got about 45,000 miles. Or should I just get rid of it and get myself a Toyota? Let's put you in a position that makes total sense. The Mini Coopers, as they age, become endless money pits. But generally, not until they get 80, 90,000 miles or more. And if you only got like less than 50 on it, it still might last a while. But it'll eventually become a money pit. There's no arguing that. I would attempt to sell that vehicle now. So a lot of people like those. You might find some fool who doesn't understand how they are to give you a decent amount of money for it. If you can, sell it right away. Now, let's say you try selling it and you don't have any bites for any serious amount of money, then just drive it. What the heck? Because if people are going to offer you a few thousand for it, you might as well just drive it. And then if something goes down, years down the line, just get rid of them, buy another car. Planning on borrowed money anyways with that because it is very low mileage. A lot of people like those 
those things so he might give you some good bucks and if they do sell it immediately and then get yourself a Toyota that would make sense but if you don't get anything for it at all you might as well just keep driving hey maybe it'll last with that small mileage of four or five years and not cost you a fortune and what the heck but if you can sell it not for good money sell it so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos remember to ring that bell